Today with topic seven, we're going to be talking about evidence of evolution. So here the question is, what do homologous structures and similarities in embryonic development suggest about the process of evolutionary change? So the point of this is, in evolutionary theory, it explains that the existence of homologous structures, homo, remember, means same, so these structures are very similar or the same, adapted to different purposes as a result of descent with modification from a common ancestor. That means that as they came from a common ancestor, all these different descendants, they slowly modified into different structures, but they all have um, look similar. They might not look exactly the same, kind of like these different um, and uh, different types of limbs, front limbs of amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, but they all contain similar bones or the same idea of basic bones. And the idea is also that they all came that their common ancestor is an ancient lobe fin fish. So if you look all of them, they all have different colors and you can compare them. So the blue right here in the front of all of them is the phalanges or the fingers. The red is the metacarpals, which is like the palm of your hand, the bones right there. The green is the carpals. You can see them amongst all of them. The purple is the ulna and the radius, which is where your forearm is. And then this is the humerus which is where the top part of your arm is. And you can see them even in the ancient lobe fin fish. So homologous structures, um, with them, Darwin proposed that animals with similar structures evolved from a common ancestor with a very basic form of that structure. So all of these structures shared by related species have been inherited from the common structure are called homologous structures. Once again, homo means same. So these structures are the same. So they te uh, biologists have tested whether structures by, um, are homologous by studying anatomical details, so how they grow or how they develop in embryos, and then how they've appeared in throughout evolutionary history. So these limbs evolved with modifications, like I said before, from the front limbs of a common ancestor whose bones resembled that of a fish. So while these structures are help determine how recently um, they were shared by a common ancestor. Um, that That's the way we're able to tell. So, for example, the front limbs of reptiles and birds are more similar to each other than that of the front limb of an amphibian or a mammal. So that tells us that reptiles and birds are more closely related and that they share a more recent common ancestor than the others. So biologists have also identified homologies in many other organisms. So plants, they all have the same basic structures of stems, roots, and flowers, more or less. Homologous structures means that they share a common structure, but not the same function. So a bird's wing and a horse's front limb have different functions, but similar structures. Analogous structures are different. They share a common function, but not the structure. So the wing of a bee and the wing of a bird are analogous structures. The wing of a bird has hollow bones. The wing of a bee, there is no bones. Just picture that bird's wings on a bee. It would sink down because it's too heavy. You can't lift it. Now, not all homologous structures have important functions. So there is something called vestigial structures, which are inherited from ancestors, but have lost much of their original function. We have many as humans, and I'm going to show you a couple in just a minute. So we've lost them due to different selection pre uh, pressures, so different things that have influenced us. So I don't know if you guys knew this, but uh, dolphins and whales used to have legs. So they used to be able to walk on water, not walk on water. They used to be able to walk on land and go in the water. So those hip bones are actually still kind of there, but they're very, very, very smart, small and provide obviously no function at all. So these are some different vestigial structures on humans. So we have ear muscles, which are the muscles behind our ears. And what they used to be for is, a, so some people have them and some people don't. So those people that are able to wiggle their ears, they still have them. That's vestigial. Most of us don't. I know I don't. Um, tonsils are also vestigial. They really provide no, fun, uh, no function at all. Male nipples are also a vestigial structure. Coccyx, which is your tailbone. We use all mammals used to have a tail, or all mammals have a tail. That's one of the things for it. Humans have lost their tail over time. 
So we only have the tailbone remnant. Um, body hair plus goosebumps. Goosebumps used to make us, um, so any animal that has a lot of body hair, as humans, we lost some of our body hair, but what they used to be for is, um, so when you were being attacked by another animal or by a predator or whatever it is, your hair used to stand on end to make you appear larger. We don't need that. Appendix, it used to help with breaking down some kind of food. And wisdom teeth used to help us break down plant, like debris, as we were chewing on it. Now, I like to mess with Ms. Samayoa, who is your other biology teacher. And I like to tell her that the gallbladder is also vestigial because I don't have one. And obviously, I can eat and function well without a gallbladder. Now, in reality, the gallbladder is not vestigial because it does have a function before something happens to it, like mine did. Um, so it you it provides and um, it helps you digest fat, and then it makes bile, which is that yellow stuff sometimes that happens when you throw up. So it does have a function, and it we but we can function well without it. So why do we have vestigial structures, even though there's little to no function? Well, the p presence of the vestigial structure doesn't affect an organism's fitness. So us having those ear muscles or having an appendix or tonsils or anything like that doesn't really affect us until something goes wrong with it. So in that case, natural selection doesn't eliminate it. But over time, there is things happening. So I actually do not have wisdom. Well, I only had one wisdom tooth. My mom had two and my dad had four. So I'm. it might be that evolution is slowly starting to work its way out, where wisdom teeth, people don't have wisdom teeth. Overall in the world, most people have all four. I'm just one of the few people who only had one. Now, embryology is the study of embryos. So researchers noticed a long time ago that the early development stages of many animals with backbone, so those with vertebra, look very similar. So I'm going to show you guys a picture of what they look like and just a minute. So it shows that they all develop in, uh, so all these embryonic cells develop in a similar order and similar patterns. So here we have embryology. So if you look at this top right here, you can see, you can't even tell which animal is which at all. You can't tell what's human, you can't tell what's rabbit, you can't tell what's a chick, a cat, nothing. So as you start going down and as this uh, it starts developing over time, then you start noticing the differences between them. But even so, you can't really tell the differences between these three. But as they start developing even more, then we're able to tell the differences between all of them. This shows us that we all had a common ancestor at some point. So evolutionary theory offers that the most logical explanation is this is patterns of development. So similar patterns of embryological development provide evidence even more so that we descended all from a common ancestor. Now that common ancestor is so long ago, but this is proof on the fact that even though none of us are turtles or none of us are chimps or none of us are uh, salamanders, we all developed the same right in the beginning. So how can molecular biology be used to trace this process of evolution? This is talking now more about our DNA. So at the molecular level, the universal genetic code and homologous molecules provide evidence of this. So all living cells, we know this from sixth grade, seventh grade, all these things. So all living cells use information coded in our DNA and RNA. So we all have information about us in that. And it gets passed on to each generation. So this genetic code is nearly identical amongst all organisms. So that means we have similar DNA to bacteria, to yeast, to plants, to fungi, and animals. Our, our DNA is 50% similar to bananas. Now, it doesn't mean we're a banana, obviously, but we have 50% similar DNA to bananas. So right here, we have a comparison of a small portion of DNA in three animals. This is a mouse, a whale, and a chicken. Now, this sequence of Hox genes, that is what determines the head-to-tail ratio. So that determines how large that head-to-tail ratio is. Now, you basically have a mouse, very tiny, a baleen whale, very large, and a chicken, which is about, not medium-sized, but it's like small-medium. 
Now, they're going to be compared to the mouse. So the whale and the chicken are both compared to the mouse. Now, this is a sequence of DNA, all the different bases. Here, if you look, we start comparing both of them, and you look at the mouse to the whale, it has A to C. So it changes from adenine to cytosine. We go a little further, they're still the same, A to T. So this goes from adenine to thymine. And we keep going again. We have cytosine to guanine and then thymine to guanine. That's four letters that just changed. That's it. And that determined that it went from the size of a mouse to the size of a baleen whale. Now, funny enough, the mouse and the chicken are way more different than the mouse and the whale. You would think it's the opposite. It's true. But the, the mouse and the chicken have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight differences. And that determines the difference in size from a mouse to a chicken. So in Darwin's day, obviously they could not um, see DNA and they didn't have the equipment necessary to look at DNA to compare, but they looked at the physical bodies of structures. Um, so, but the physical bodies wouldn't be able to compare a mouse to yeast or bacteria. So now we know it's not only limited to the physical structures and by what we can see, but it's also part of the molecular structure. So homologous proteins share extensive structural and chemical similarities. One thing is some a protein called cytochrome C, which functions in cell respiration. This is a part of the mitochondria. So anything that has mitochondria, which almost all organisms do, plants have them and animals have them for sure. Um, so they all have similar versions of cytochrome C. So genes can be homologous true uh, as well. So one example is a set of genes, like I said before, that are known as the Hox genes, and that determines the head-to-tail ratio. So all vertebrates have some kind of Hox genes to them. Now, they're different. They might be very, very different, where they have multiple genes or multiple bases that are different, or they might be one to two changes. So today we know that the theory, which includes natural selection, offers insight that are vital to all branches of biology. So this can go from research on infectious diseases to ecology. So like any scientific theory, evolutionary theory is constantly reviewed as new data is gathered. So they're constantly adjusting it as we get new information and as archeologists keep looking for more evidence. So researchers still debate certain questions like how new species arise and why certain species become extinct. But there's a, a lot of uncertainty, uncertainty about exactly how life began. So now we're gonna be talking about primates. So what characteristics do all primates share? They're a mammal that has long fingers and toes with nails instead of claws. They have arms that can rotate around their shoulder joints. So if you just spin your arms around in circles, our arms can do that. We have a strong clavicle, which is your collarbone. We have binocular vision, which means we look forward. And we have a very well-developed cerebrum, which is your brain. So primates share several adaptations meant for life in trees. So you can see a lot of those characteristics in a lemur and how it moves around in trees and it's able to lift its arms up and grab onto different branches. So many primates have the forward-facing eyes, which give them excellent vision. Binocular vision is, helps us see things in 3D, and it allows us to have good depth perception. Depth perception is what allows you to determine how far or how close something is. So when we're walking and our depth perception is like uh, thrown off, we really can't tell where a step is or anything like that. So we tend to fall more when our depth perception is messed with. But thankfully, we have binocular vision, which allows us to do that. So there are major evolutionary groups of primates. So primates in one of these groups look very little like typical monkeys. That group is lemurs and lorises. The other group is includes tarsiers and anthropoids. And then the group that includes monkeys, great apes, and humans. Now, the group that con, um, contains lemurs and lorises, you guys know that a lot from Madagascar, the movie. That's what they look like. So humans and other primates evolved from a common ancestor that lived more than 65 million years ago. This does not mean that humans and primates, that we came from primates. We came basically from a primate ancestor 
And that primate ancestor is basically like our great, 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 great grandfather. And different, um, all these different primates have evolved from there or branched off from there. And that's what you can kind of see here. So picture this primate ancestor as a tree trunk. And that's where it all came from. And then all these different um, primates branched off from it. So here we have the lorishes and bush babies and lemurs. Once again, remember Madagascar. Tarsiers, kind of in Madagascar too. Then um, in our part, with we have the anthropoids. That is the New World monkeys, the Old World monkeys, um, gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans. But from humans to gibbons, those are all hominoids. So anthropoids split into two groups around 45 million years ago as the continents on which they lived moved apart. If you remember Pangaea, Pangaea split. So that's why we have the different continents. So great apes, also called hominoids, include gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans. So recent DNA shows that these are our closest relatives. Once again, picture the primate ancestor as a, the tree trunk. And then all these branches happened. So I like to compare it as if, if you think about your family and you think about your grandfather. And let's say your grandfather had um, many kids. He had 10 kids. And each of those 10 kids had 10 more kids. That family are all different branches. Now, they might be your cousins and they might be related to you, but they're not your immediate family. And that humans are immediate family. This is like our cousin and our distant cousin. So different adaptations have enabled us to walk upright. So our skull, our neck, our spinal column, our hip bones and leg bones all change shape. And this doesn't happen from one moment to the next, but this over time that enabled us later species to walk upright. So between six and seven million years ago, that lineage that led to human splitting um, from the lineage that led to chimpanzees. This is known as human, these humans are called hominins and include modern humans and all other species closely related to us than to chimps. So this is a different branch. We did not come from chimps or other monkeys. We split off from a branch uh, from that primate ancestor. So hominines evolved from the ability to walk upright, grasping thumbs, and large brains, we have the, like I said, the different bones. So the skull, the neck, and spinal column, hip bones, and leg bones of early humans change shape that allowed us to walk upright. So if you compare here humans and gorillas, we can see the major differences. So here in humans, we sit atop an S-shaped spine, which is S like this, like it goes down here and it goes up here, not like scoliosis where it's sideways. Um, Gorillas have a C-shaped spine, so it's just one curve. Uh, humans have a, um, a spinal cord that comes out from the bottom. Gorillas have it from the back. Our arms and leg, um, our arms and hands are shorter than our legs, and our hands don't drag on the ground when walking. Gorillas, their arms are longer than their legs, so they touch the ground when walking. Our pelvis is bowl-shaped. Theirs is long and narrow. And then our thigh bones are angled inward directly below the body. Theirs are angled away from the pelvis. So the evolution of bipedal, which means that you walk on two feet, was very important because it freed both hands up for tools. So if we weren't walking, we wouldn't be able to use our hands for the tools. Another uh, thing that evolved was a opposable thumb, which allows us to touch each tip of our fingers, which allows us to grasp objects and use tools. Hominins evolve much larger brains. Most of the difference in brain size results from an expanded cerebrum, which is a thinking part of your brain. So there's different fossil records, including seven generations. So Salanthropus, Oran, Ardipithecus, Australopithecus, Paranthropus, Kenyanthropus, and Homo. There's a lot of different types of Homo species for humans, and there's at least 20 species. Now, all these species are relatives of modern humans, but not all of them are ancestors. So here you can see 
the different um, the different types. And I'm going to show you now a picture of their skulls. Here is a comparison of a modern human, a chimpanzee, a gorilla. Here you have a Homo neanderthal, a Homo erectus, um, an Australopithecus afarensis. Actually, I don't know if that's Australopithecus, but this is afarensis, and you can see the diff way the structure of the faces have changed over time. So we have some differences between relatives versus ancestors, and you can see how we have like a bunch of different branches, but some of those branches are dead end. So in 2002, paleontologists discovered a fossil record um, about seven, that was dated about seven million years ago. And they called that Silanthropus, which is a million years older than any known hominin. They had a, a brain about the size of a modern chimp, but its short, broad face was very much like humans as opposed to chimps. They don't know if to determine this as a hominin or not. It, there's a, data, a debate about it. So the more recent Paranthropus species had very huge grinding back teeth, very similar to our wisdom teeth. And their diets probably included a lot of fibrous plants, similar to those eaten by modern gorillas. Now, paleontologists, they place this Paranthropus on a separate dead end branch of our family tree. So what current scientific thinking about the genus Homo? So if you look at the hominin timeline, you can see many species in our genes, in our genus existed before our species, Homo sapiens, appeared. So at least three other Homo species existed at the same time as early humans. So here you could see this is Homo sapiens, and you can kind of see an overlap between Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalis. And at, they originally were thought that they didn't mix at all. But there's been data that proves that Homo neanderthalus and Homo sapiens made it at some point and kind of created like a different like mix of both. But you can also see here that Homo neanderthalus and um, this hom hominid species right here overlapped. Um, Homo erectus also overlapped with a bunch of different species. Homo ergaster overlapped with Homo erectus and Homo habilis as well. So the fossils of this new group of hominid species resemble modern bo human bones and they're classified in the genus Homo. So one set of fossils that was found with tools made of stone and bone was Homo habilis, which means handyman. The earliest fossils that researchers were able to assign to the genus Homo is Homo ergaster, which is right here. Now they were very large and, and they were lar larger than Homo habilis and had a bigger brain and then their nostrils face downward instead of um, forward, like more of our older species of humans. So researchers agree that our genus originated in Africa and migrated from there. So remember Pangaea and that a lot of continents were a lot closer. So the idea is that we all came from Africa, somewhere in Africa, and then we all spread out and we all started migrating around the world and therefore changed um, over time. Um, you can see how people slowly change. We can see the diversity now, especially where uh, we have different skin colors, we have different facial structures, all these things. And that was evolution over time. But at first we all looked very similar here in Africa. So Neanderthals flourished in Europe and Western Asia about 200,000 years ago. They had tools, they lived in complex social groups, they knew how to use fire, they were hunters, and they even performed burial rituals, which means like they buried their dead and probably lay, put a stone there. Um, about 50,000 years ago, Homo sapien populations, including some known as Cro-Magnums, which um, subspecies of humans, were using new technology, like uh, sophisticated stone blades, and they were making tools from bones and that. Um, antlers, and we have some cave paintings of them, and they buried their dead in more elaborate rituals than just burying them. So Neanderthals and Homo sapiens lived side by side. Like I said, they mated. So both groups moved into Europe where they coexisted. And then for the last 24,000 years ago, Homo sapiens have been the only hominin. So why didn't Neanderthals disappear? 
And yes, they did interbreed with Homo sapiens. Like I said, there's evidence now. And that's it.